in our cybersecurity world, the data provenance and the data lineage is incredibly important to being accurate with our threat mitigation and threat detection. I, I think where we start um, and where we've really been in this data integrity focus for a number of years now is it all starts with the, with the proper governance frameworks, making sure that everyone understands the rules of the road, what is proper, what is not, what is class, you know, what, how data is classified, um, you know, where where it is derived from. And, uh, and what its motion is to convert to information, which obviously you know, helps us convert it to action. Um, we also use a number of tools in the data integrity space for automated validation and cleansing. Um, I, again, when you're working it with AI, especially high-speed models, um, extract, transform, and load becomes a, um, not just a mechanical thing, but a, a, an assurance that your, your models and that your, uh, that your answers are coming in um, you know, with, with, with a reasonable amount of fidelity. Uh, you know, running a big software shop, um, uh, you know, on my side, uh, strict version control, um, you know, not, not, in, not endeavoring into self-afflicted wounds or, or forgetting that, um, you know, that proper software engineering discipline, um, you know, putting things out in, in uh, slow versions until you ramp up to full capability also ensures data integrity. It's not something everyone all always thinks of, but, um, you'll start to see data, you know, data errors and, and, and things like that early on, and it's easier to mitigate them then. And then uh, end-to-end monitoring, of course, um, uh, anomaly detection. I'll let some of my colleagues get into that. We do a, a, a great amount of that, but it sounds like we have some folks who are really um, probably um, on the forefront of that. Uh, the last thing is, um, especially in the national security realm, uh, d- secure data storage and access control, uh, you will read our CISA advisories and find out that we're very concerned about access control and secure by design every day. Um, don't need to put that out there or plug that. Um, and then, of course, you know, on, honestly, it's just day to day consistency, reliability, making sure that we audit on a regular basis. Um, you know, those all, you know, not just for, you know, in the data, the data integrity realm is bringing it into a different thing, not just the accuracy of the data, but, um, you know, the, the understanding of making sure that we understand the roots of bias, the roots of, um, of problems. And, and even in some cases, I hate to say the, the intentional misuse of the data that, that confounds our models. Okay. And Ryan, what do you think? You, you, you spent a lot of time thinking about this issue too. Yeah, that's correct. I, I want a little bit more to talk about why data integrity is important. Uh, I think that's, that's the core principle for this because it's important because we want to be able to trust the AI model that we, we created or somebody else created. I think that's, the, the, the core principle of security and also integrity here is the is the trust of it, right? So that we can build this trust. Um, I think um, I kind of see this in like three different parts. There's the collection part of it, there's the validation part of it, and there's the cleaning part of it. Because um, it's it's kind of like a vicious circle that that we have to build. And um, so that data collection is is kind of give us a build like a building block for a strong foundation of the of that. Um, AI data that that we're gonna probably put in front of some somebody or another another AI, right? I think the um, the credibility of the source that the, the data that we collected in, uh, uh, and if, especially if we're gonna put this in front of uh, public, um, the diversity and representativeness, ethical considerations, right? Like, and uh, those are those are also extremely important from a data collection perspective. Um, from a data validation perspective, um, I think uh, internally we're gonna build not only just Technology products. We also need to build processes that that does quality checks, does some sort of verification, and then uh, especially um, again, like if it's going to be a public one, uh, it's going to be a biased audit. Um, is this is this biased? And it's not just you know, I mean, we talk maybe think about bias. We talk about we think about maybe human bias, but it's I don't know if you if you're let's say creating an AI model that does logistics, uh, it's going to give these uh, logistics to a self-driving um, vehicle. And if, if you collect your data from one or a couple of um, drivers, that they have a they have an awesome donut shop stop, that's going to be biased through that donut shop stop. Maybe it's not the optimal route, but it's you know bias comes in a different way too, right? So not just uh, uh, human bias. Um, you got to test with real world world scenarios. Um, that that's the way you can detect these um, and data cleaning, right? And if, if you have a junk data set that you don't clean up. Um, that's not going to provide provide good value at the end of the day. It, it might get spoiled. It might depend on um, what kind of data you do, right? So you talk about real world, Gene. For you, you know, you, you spend a lot of time. How are you? How are you addressing this, or how are you seeing other organizations address these? Well, how we address it is a one part of the problem. 
because as a threat intelligence company, we are collecting massive amounts of data that is outside of most people's firewalls. And as we're collecting anything from social media to dark web and all these things, you know, we have a very um, almost like Ford assembly line process and actually detailing the whole process. And as like David mentioned before, it's the irony, right? I mean, I think we talked about this one in 2000 where we're talking about data warehouses. And I think the same methodology, same process in which we get the data, to process the data, transfer the data, load, all this process hasn't really changed. Now we are adding this whole AI components to it. Uh, so for us, you know, as a former data center operator and, you know, using data warehouses in the past, it's nothing really changed. Like, and when I say technologically, uh, but I think when I look at it from our customers, you know, because we work, well, I think I have a different perspective because what we do see is from our client is that they are acquiring massive amounts of data, not just from their own internal infrastructure, but anything from ad tech to dark web to financial or anything that they could get a handle so that they could actually build models that is at a scale for like nation state and everything else. Katie, you, I know you've spent a lot of time on this particular topic. What, what do you think? Yeah, this is, this is near and dear to my heart. So I'm happy to hear my colleagues speaking about it. Um, so, I mean, data and the integrity of data used in AI models is fundamental to understanding potential biases, exactly as, as Emory said, as well as other risks as we start to talk about the, the sort of life cycle of um, AI and thinking about mitigating risks, I mean, it all sort of starts with data. Um, and, but the, the uh, challenges, and I actually have a question for my colleagues and sort of how they're seeing this uh, play out, but, you know, data documentation uh, is so critical to understanding data integrity. So where did this data come from? No data is neutral, no data you know, it's all created about humans by humans and all of that documentation is so important. Um, but generative AI products, especially large language models, large image models, tend to break that that uh, integrity chain, right? You, you, you may be using a model that was trained on data. You have no idea what was in that data. The whole point is that there's a lot of it, right? Um, and things like data sheets for data sets, just which are, you know, best practice in the sort of classifier world of, 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 uh, um, of AI are not necessarily best practices in generative AI. And so I'm wondering how people are addressing that tension um, in their own work and in their own consultancies. Veronica, do you want to add either opine on this or answer it? Yeah, I think, uh, Katie, those are fantastic points, and I'm glad you brought brought up that question. So for, for in terms of thinking of biases and uh, controlling where the data comes from, from a legal, legal perspective, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, one of the things that I recommend for everyone is talk to your legal teams so that you could have those conversations about where the data is coming from, whether there was initial con uh, documented consent of the collection of data. If the vendors from whom you're getting the data that you're going to use for your algorithm, uh, for your algorithms, excuse me, are, you know, that, that the vendors actually have the documentation so that should there be an issue down the line, and again, as an attorney, I think of compliance, right? So keeping your company safe so that you can say, here's, you know, here's the math, here's here are all the documents that we have, here are all the steps we took to understand where the data came from, but also to Kate's point, addressing where potential biases can be identified because we're dealing with structured data, unstructured data. We're dealing with, you know, different types of algorithms that are making up the different products and services. So not only is it important for me as a legal person, but I think it should be important to open up those communications. And sometimes legal doesn't seem approachable, but really if you, if, if you reach out to legal to educate legal on where the data comes from, what you're doing with it, in assessing what the legal um, framework is, it's easier to tackle that at the beginning of the stage of, of product or service development versus getting on the line, dealing with a regulatory agency and then having to talk to an attorney so that you can address those issues uh, when you know they're hitting the fan. You know, I like what you're saying and I, I'm, I'm gonna just add on the, the smart comments by my other panelists on this. We tend to break the problem into two different areas when it comes to data integrity and data quality. One of the problems it's harder to solve, which is if you're using, you know, a closed LLM, 
what's the data provenance, other things like that. And, and that is something we, I think we definitely need, need to be mindful, especially in terms of biases, other things like that. But we obviously have less control if we're using OpenAI or Anthropic or pick your favorite large language model. I think what's more important for organizations is when they're using generative AI, specifically with retrieval augmented generation, when they're feeding the information to generative AI, there's two parts of the data quality part of it we need to look at. One is, do we have an effective data security classification policy and, and are we feeding the right data into that? Are we, are we making sure that we're not giving proprietary or personal information or other information we don't intend right. to feed to our large language model? The other one is gonna sound a little um, tactical or maybe even a little pedestrian, but a lot of times this comes down to a basic records management problem. Too often organizations have lots of different copies of data and some of them are good copies and some of them are, are not good copies. And if we're gonna wanna teach our large language model with RAG some of this information, um, I think fundamentally that goes back to how do you have an up-to-date records program and are you enforcing it, especially for the structured and unstructured data. Um, and that's a big part of it. And, and so organizations, uh, we see a lot of mistakes where they're feeding that into that.